All right. It's one of my favorite topics, children's literature. I love my books. We're not going to talk about all my books today, but I am going to talk about the most common genres and formats of books that we use with elementary social studies. Really important topic because you might be given a textbook to teach with. This was the textbook that I was given for fourth grade social studies in Utah, and it was okay. But it was so much funner to use books to talk about the dinosaurs in eastern Utah and to read a historical fiction book about the Pony Express in Utah and to uh, read uh, some books about geography of Utah in different ways. So much more fun, and I really believe this statement that books, children's books, extend the curriculum beyond any textbook constraints. Uh, but to really understand them, you need to understand these two terms, genre and format. They're used to describe a whole collection of different books. So you really have to know these basics. They might even be on a quiz and a test uh, for my class. A genre. Genre is a category of books characterized by a particular style, format, or content. It's a category. Whereas a format is what defines the shape, the size, the general makeup of a particular book. So dividing this list up, you see the most common formats we're going to talk about are picture books and graphic novels. Picture books could be a science fiction, or a picture book could be a biography, or it could be about poetry. But the format is a picture book, and the genre would be one of those others. Whereas you could have a uh, biography about someone's life, and it could be a graphic novel instead of a picture book. So understand these basic differences. A genre, category, a format is the size and shape and how it's kind of laid out. Now, um, taking that consideration, we're going to talk about four main things here. We're going to talk about two genres, nonfiction, pretty self-explanatory, it's all true, and historical fiction, which is kind of interesting. We'll, we'll define that more in a moment. And formats, picture books, and graphic novels. Now, you understand when we're looking at these books, they might fit a number of categories, like Moonshot here. This book, Moonshot, by one of my favorite authors, artists, Brian Flocka, is a nonfiction book. It has beautiful illustrations, but it's all facts about the Apollo 11 mission. But since it's a picture book, it fits into that picture book format and with just gorgeous, gorgeous pictures in it. So understand that books fit in both a genre and a format. This is from a series called Nathan Tell's Hazardous Tales. And it is the underground abductor uh, about the Underground Railroad. And it fits as a graphic novel. And we'll talk more about graphic novels in a minute. But it's historical fiction because not all the things that happen in this book actually happened in real life. It's been made up. It's about Harriet Tubman, true, but the words and some of the situations are made up. So it's fictional that way, but it's based on a real person, a historical event. And uh, it's also nonfiction because it does contain facts about the slave trade, the triangular trade. So this is kind of an interesting one, fits in a number of different categories. So don't get too stuck on fitting a book in a specific genre or a specific format. They might, uh, be, um, they might go across several different ones. All right. So we're going to talk about how books might fit in these categories about the same topic. So here's the topic of the Transcontinental Railroad. Great topic, and I can find a book in each one of these. Here is a nonfiction book, which is wonderful. It's not a picture book or a graphic novel. It's another format. And here is a novel that's in historical fiction. But here is a picture book called Coolies, which would also fit in the historical fiction category. And here is a graphic novel, which is like a comic book, which is also historical fiction based off of true events. But not all of it is true. So let's first of all talk about these nonfiction books. Nonfiction simply means it's facts. You know, and here's the moonshot again. Often it will contain pictures or text or a combination, especially for kids because they want to keep the interest. The great thing about these nonfiction books is there could be at a variety of reading levels. So here are three different books about the Wright brothers. And it should be pretty easy for you to see that the one on the far left, that's at a pretty easy reading level. In fact, there's only three paragraphs of words on that page. Whereas the one in the middle, First Flight, 
That only has two paragraphs, but the paragraphs are much longer and have larger words, harder reading difficulty. Whereas the one that's sitting right above me, The Wright Brothers by Russell Friedman, much more text-based, not as many pictures, much more difficult to read. So you've got a variety of reading levels, so you could be talking about this subject and have your students have differentiation with uh, books at their reading level, which is a great thing with nonfiction books. The other thing about nonfiction books, I call them my grazing books. These are the books that if I told my students, go find a book to read for the next 15 minutes, these are the type of books that you just kind of pick up and you just kind of look at and enjoy. You don't necessarily read them from front cover to back cover. You're kind of like a cow or an animal grazes out in the field, you move from part to part. That's the way we do nonfiction books. You kind of look around and see all sorts of interesting things in the books. Um, the other thing about nonfiction books is they come in this huge variety of formats. Um, Torpedoed uh, is a more of a novel, whereas Independent Dames is a great picture book. Isaac the Alchemist about um, Isaac, um, Isaac Newton is more of a, a read. Uh, this Incredible Cabinet of Wonders is a lot of fun. It has flip doors you can pull up and look at. So a huge variety of things in nonfiction books, huge variety of formats, lots of things to offer the students, and a really fun way to engage them in facts about real-life events and people. Um, the second category is just a little bit different. It's historical fiction. These are stories that are based off of real-life events, like the U.S. Civil War, but the actual stories have been made up. They're based off of real facts. They might even be based off of real people like Bull Run is. But for the most part, it's a fictional story that's been created about that event. Now, historical fiction are great because they really personalize history. This is a book, I, I would read it to you, but I would cry. I always cry when I read this book. It's called Pink and Say, well, I, another one of my favorite authors, Patricia Polacco. Uh, but it's about two boys who join um, together in the Civil War and survive. Well, one of them survives, one of them doesn't. But it personalizes the whole aspect of what the Civil War meant to different people. And it personalizes it enough to make me cry. So go read this book, Pink, and say, have your tissues ready. Uh, historical fiction can also present some really complex issues. Some things you maybe never ever thought of. Uh, the book Number of the Stars, which is a common read in 4th, 5th, and 6th grade, is all about the Holocaust in World War II. That's a complex issue. But the book's uh, relatable enough and readable enough that you could use it in 4th, uh, 5th, and 6th grade. Prisoner 88, it is about a young boy in Idaho based off of a true story. But he was imprisoned in the Idaho Penitentiary for shooting his father who was beating uh, and abusing his mother and he was put in prison historical fiction uh, forge is about the civil war not the, excuse me not the civil war the Re u.s revolutionary war but it's about slavery during the revolutionary war so complex issues in here um, the other thing about historical fiction books is they're great what i call conduit books like this one, John Paul George and Ben, a hilariously fun book, uh, completely made up. Well, not completely made up. It's based off of true people and facts. But it's a fun book to read, but that might get a student interested in reading uh, a longer book about Thomas Jefferson. Or someone might read uh, the historical fiction book, I Survived, The Sinking of the Titanic, and that might get them into more of the books about the Titanic. So great way to... Uh, to get them involved. Now let's talk about some formats of books. Picture books are probably the most common because they're the funnest to look at. I mean their illustrations are are the whole uh, kind of delivery method of the book. So you get a lot of details and content from the illustrations and the illustrators for these are fabulous. Here's a great picture book about Bass Reeves, a US Deputy Marshal. He was black, a former slave. Fabulous picture book. The thing about picture books is they can be a wide variety of genres. They could be historical fiction, like Boss of the Plains, all about the creation of the uh, Stetson hat. Uh, they could be biographies. You know, here's one about Cervantes and how he wrote the book Don Quixote. Um, here's one about 
a gal who uh, helped sew the, the U.S. flag during the Revolutionary War. Or they could, you know, they could just have a wide variety of formats. Picture books are great, and they're engaging because of the pictures. Uh, the other great thing about picture books is how they can really address complex topics, which really can lead you into a good way to introduce um, a, a bigger unit. For instance, A Different Pond is all about a boy whose father came over during the 70s during the Vietnam boat lift and lives in uh, Minnesota. And it talks about the complexities of these first-generation Americans who are also living within the cultures of their family and the complexity that that can bring into those relationships between father and son and living in between two worlds. Uh, here's Flowers for Sarajevo, all about the conflict in the town of Sarajevo, Yugoslavia. Um, really good ways to introduce topics. So enjoy some picture books out there. Uh, picture books are never too old. Students are never too old to enjoy a good picture book. I have read picture books to high school students and they love them. I've read picture books to you as college students and I hopefully you will love them. But don't be afraid to use picture books with whatever age level you teach. Now the last format that really gets used a lot and is becoming really popular in social studies is graphic novels. It's kind of a comic, but it's not a comic. It's from Japan. They often really can get these big historical events or topics and really condense them into an understandable, relatable way. And here's some of the ones that I've read. But you can see these are not small topics here. I mean, how do you take the, uh, the invention of the first atomic bomb and make it understandable for kids? You make it into a comic book. Graphic novels are great at this. They have a, a less complex text structure, but they can really address really complex things. Now, some of these things I wouldn't, some of these books you see on the screen, I wouldn't necessarily use with elementary kids like Mouse. Mouse is a graphic novel about a extermination concentration camp in World War II. I would use it in high school, but I would be really hesitant to use it in elementary school. Um, so don't be, don't be eager to maybe grab one and just use it without looking at it first because they can have some really complex elements to them uh, but they also can be very simplified and really interesting and once again they're gateways you know if you can get a, a young reader who doesn't necessarily like to read but enjoys the pictures get him into comic books he may read this graphic history of Gettysburg as a comic and really like it and then want to go explore more about Gettysburg or the Civil War so graphic novels are great things, great books that are out there. Now, the last one, this is kind of the bonus one I want to throw in, are biographies and autobiographies. You know, these accounts of a person's life. And I want you to know on these next few slides, these are all biographies, autobiographies, that have been published in the last two years. So these are all some of my newest books. And they're probably the most common book that gets published for um, elementary school kids. The great thing about biographies and autobiographies is they're really meaningful. We talk about that in elementary social studies. Remember the NCSS statement that social studies should be meaningful? These are meaningful to kids. These are about people doing real things. This is about Mary Blair here, who was an artist. And you probably know her work because she designed all the artwork for It's a Small World and Peter Pan and several other um, of the Disneyland attractions. And she did it because she loved art. And kids can relate to that. They love art. They, they can get to that. Boys who love football might read about the racism that the uh, 1947 Harvard football team uh, experienced because they allowed a black member of their football team to participate. Uh, these are just really meaningful stories to kids. Real people doing real things. Here's a man who, as a boy, started planting one tree a day for the last 40 years of his life and has really replanted a lot of forests in India. Really an amazing story. Now, the second thing about biographies and autobiographies are value-based. And remember, we talked about values. Uh, social studies is a value-based proposition. You want to teach values. And biographies can do that. You can learn about a soldier, a Hispanic soldier, who comes back from World War I into a nation of inequality and, and you can see the values that he chooses and the choices he makes. Um, here is Sue, who is a scientist who discovered a dinosaur, which she called Sue, 
the T-Rex, one of the most, actually I think it is the most complete T-Rex dinosaur ever discovered. But it's about her journey and the decision she made as a young woman who really was not encouraged to go into science and the values and choices she made. So some great uh, value-based education in biographies and autobiographies. Um, they're also challenging, and remember that was one of those other things the NCSS statement talked about, is social studies in elementary school ought to be challenging. There is a book out there for everyone. And not just picture books. There are more complex books uh, for kids to read. This book, What Would You Do With a Voice Like That, is a wonderful book about Congressman Barbara Jordan, one of the first black um, congresswomen in the U.S. Here's a wonderful book about uh, a Chinese scientist, which has a lot of science content, can be quite complex. Uh, here's a novel about a Hispanic uh, actress, Diana Guerrero. You might have seen her in uh, several television shows, but it's her novel about her experience as an immigrant. So there's always something out there, always something to challenge a student at whatever level that they're at. So I love biographies, autobiographies. It's probably the biggest part of my book collection. Uh, of all the books that I have, I probably have more biographies and autobiographies than, than anything else. So just to recap, books are great. Use them because they are much more meaningful than just a textbook. They can really extend the curriculum. And number two, books are just a lot of fun. You find a wide variety, you share lots of different stories with students, and hopefully they'll love books as much as you love books. And you can really engage them in the science that is social studies. Thanks so much.